so good to see you this morning. Let's stand to our feet and worship together. Psalm 92 says, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. So we're gonna sing Psalm 92 right now. I'll give thanks to you, Lord.
Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Would you remain standing real quick because we want to celebrate Believer's Baptism. And let's not do that sitting down, all right? Let's watch Believer's Baptism. Good morning, Grace Baptist Church. How are you doing today? We're about to celebrate two guys in Believer's Baptism. I'm just talking to my brother J uh, Jason over here. Great story. Following through in the first step in obedience, being a role model and example for his kids out there, okay? So if you've got questions, if you've not been baptized and you need to do that, make sure you, you, you talk to one of us so you can nail that down today. Go ahead, Jason. Give Jason shots. And Jesus is Lord, my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Jason, based upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried in the light of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Tyler Campbell, and Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Tyler, based upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bearing the light of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Give the Lord praise, y'all. Hallelujah. Okay, now you can sit down. It's kind of hard to, to celebrate sitting down, isn't it? All right, so hey, we want to welcome everybody this morning. We always do this every week to make sure our guests feel welcome. If you would do something, if you are a guest and you're in the room and you've not done this before, in front of you, you will find a connect card. If you would fill that out sometime during the service, and as we dismiss, Pastor Bobby and Miss Cindy will be over here to my left at a kiosk. If you present them with that card, they would love to meet you, get to know you a little bit. And we never want to forget you at home. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. We pray that it is soon you'll be joining us back, those of you that are local, in the, the church house. So we're just praying that we'll see you soon. But if you are at home and you've never done this, we're going to ask you to, to, uh, to text the word CONNECT to 865-413-8181. If you uh, text CONNECT that, then just follow the prompts, and that'll be a way you can do your CONNECT card, all right? That's also an option for you in the room, but we prefer you do the card. That way, you can have something to bring up Pastor Bobby and Miss Cindy, all right? All right, we're going to continue moving on now. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Brian as we celebrate some graduations. Amen, amen. How are you, church? Good. Happy Sunday to you. Graduation season is upon us, and so we have several graduates that we're going to recognize this morning, high school and college, and even a PhD graduate with us today. Um, and there are 40 names that we're going to recognize. So I would ask if you could please hold your applause until the end. I'll give you a chance at the end to applaud these graduates and to pray for them. Uh, but if you could hold your applause as we go through these names, that would really, really help us. So our first graduate with us today is Miss Emma Asbury. Emma is the daughter of Amy and David Asbury. She is graduating from Carnes High School, and she plans to, to have more employment at Tonoba North in the food service department. Good job, Emma. Next is Mr. Sean Asbury. Sean is the son of Amy and David Asbury. He is also graduating from Carnes High School, plans to attend Tennessee College of Applied Technology in Morristown and focus on aviation maintenance. Next, we have Mr. Angelina Aspira. Angelina is the daughter of Kelly and Alfredo Aspira. She's graduating from Hardin Valley Academy, plans to attend the University of Tennessee Knoxville and major in pre-med. Next is Miss Ella Brooks. Ella is the daughter of Sarah and Steve Brooks. She's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend Mars Hill University to major in exercise science and play softball. Next we have Mr. Noah Bruin. Noah Bruin is the son of John and Natalie Bruin. He's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend the University of Tennessee Knoxville and majoring in kinesiology and minoring in communications. And then we do want to pause here and recognize someone who would have graduated with this class who we know and love, and that's Mr. Mark Calloway, who passed away tragically this past year. And in his place, Morris and Alicia Calloway are going to come forward and receive a gift for Mark. He was a graduate, would have been a graduate at Carnes High School and is loved by many of us here.
Amen. church. Next we have Miss Madison DeVault. Madison is the daughter of Randy and Micah DeVault. She's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend the University of Tennessee Knoxville and major in nursing. Next we have Miss Bonnie Dudley. Bonnie is the daughter of Renee and David Dudley. She's graduating from Rivers Edge Christian Academy plans to attend Miami University, major in education and psychology. She's also a figure skater. Then we have Mr. Harrison Fessmeyer. Harrison is the son of Chris and Elisa Fessmeyer. He's graduating from Oak Ridge High School, plans to attend Roan State and major in engineering. Next we have Mr. Benjamin Francisco. Ben is the son of Ted and Teresa Francisco. He's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend Boyce College in Louisville, Kentucky, and major in theological studies. Next, we have Miss Marianne Gabriel. Marianne is the daughter of Michelle and Michael Gabriel. She's graduating from Grace Christian Academy. She plans to attend the Pellissippi State Community College for two years and then transfer to the University of Tennessee and pursuing a degree in nursing. Next, we have Miss Lainey Griffin. Lainey is the daughter of Casey and Jan Griffin. She's graduating from Bearden High School, plans to attend Roan State and major in nursing. Next is Mr. Wesley Hitch. Wes is the son of Denise and Brian Hitch. He's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend Pellissippi State Community College for the first two years, and then transfer to Bryan College to study theological studies. Next is Miss Faith Jeffers. Faith is the daughter of Michelle and Tim Jeffers. She's graduating from Carnes High School, plans to attend the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and major in biology. Next is Miss Faith Kitts. Faith, Faith is the daughter of Brian and Kristen Kitts. She's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend Pellissippi and major in business and marketing. Not with us, but we want to recognize Mr. Connor Lawson as well. Connor is the son of Jeff and Lisa Lawson. He's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend the University of Tennessee Knoxville and major in pre-pharmacy. And with us is Miss Kenna Lyle. Kenna is the daughter of Shannon and Dan Lyle. She's graduating from Central High School, plans to attend the University of Tennessee, and her major is currently undecided. Next is Mr. Corey Merida. Corey is the son of Michael and Nancy Merida. He's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend the University of Tennessee Knoxville and major in mechanical engineering. Next we have Mr. Zachariah Morales. Zach is the son of Alfredo and Rebecca Morales. He's graduating from Powell High School and is gonna be pursuing a degree in plumbing, following the trades. Then not with us, but we wanna recognize Mr. Riley Morgan. Riley Morgan is the son of Colby and Kristen Morgan. He's graduating from Hardin Valley Academy. He will be attending Tennessee Tech University and majoring in mechanical engineering. Next, we have Miss Lindsay Morgan. Lindsay is the daughter of Lisa and Randy Morgan. She's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend the University of Tennessee Knoxville and study pre-medicine. Next, we have Mr. Spencer Myers. Spencer, or Noodle, as we call him, is the son of Christy and Rodney Myers. He's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend Boyce College in Louisville, Kentucky, in pursuit of biblical counseling major. Then we have Miss Sierra Roche. Sierra is the daughter of Stephen and Rebecca Roche. She's graduating from Carnes High School and plans to pursue a career in entrepreneurial real estate. Then we have Miss McKenna Rook. McKenna is the daughter of David and Kim Rook. She's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend Milligan University where she will also be playing soccer and majoring in psychology. Now we have Mr. Daniel Silver. Daniel is the son of Barry and Ellen Silver. He's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend the University of Tennessee 
and major in biological sciences. We're almost there. Next we have Miss Carly Spaulding. Carly is the daughter of Julie and Paul, and she is graduating from Farragut High School, and she's pursuing a career as an entrepreneur. Then we have Miss Haley Stansberry. Haley is the daughter of Jamie and Todd Stansberry. She's graduating from Grace Christian Academy. Haley plans to study marketing at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Next is Mr. N. Startup. Ian is the son of Dan and Jill Startup. He's graduating from Grace Christian Academy. He's attending the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and majoring in engineering. Next is Mr. Mr. Seth Stevens. Seth is the son of Chrissy and Joel Stevens. He's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend Pellissippi State and major in audio engineering. Next is Mr. Caleb Talent. Caleb is the son of Ray and Nancy Talent. He's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, Plans to go to Pellissippi and study electrical engineering. Next, we have Miss Morgan Tate. Morgan Tate is the daughter of Chris and Melissa, and she is graduating from Fulton High School, plans to attend the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and major in nursing. Next, we have Mr. Philip Taylor. Philip is the son of Glenda and Jeff Taylor. He's graduating from Grace Christian Academy plans to go to the Pellissippi State Community College and then transfer to UTK and major in business. Next is Miss Abby West. Abby is the daughter of Julie and Michael West. She's graduating from Grace Christian Academy, plans to attend Pellissippi State and then transfer to Tennessee Tech University and major in elementary education. Next is Miss Jenny Windham. Jenny is the daughter of Brian and Lana Windham. She's graduating from Grace Christian Academy and plans to attend the University of Tennessee, Knoxville and major in marketing. So this is all of our high school graduates. Would you give them a hand? We also have college and post-college graduates to recognize as well. And so the first college graduate we have to recognize is Mr. Josh Adams who has graduated from Tennessee Tech University with a bachelor's in computer engineering and a 4.0, which is a big deal. Josh is the son of Kim and Brian Adams, and his plan is to now pursue a master's degree from TTU as well. Behind him and married to him is Madeline Adams, who is the daughter of Suzanne and Aaron Love. She's graduating from Tennessee Tech University as well with a bachelor's in electrical engineering plans to design an engineering firm in Knoxville. Next, we have Miss Morgan Brown. Morgan is the daughter of Kay and Joel Brown. She's graduating from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and she has a Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology and would like to pursue the counseling field. Next is Miss Katie Beth Cry. Katie Beth is the daughter of Todd and Lori Ryan, and also Brad Cry. She's graduating from the University of Tennessee. She has a bachelor's in social work and plans to continue her education and get a master's in social work as well. Next, we have Ms. Joni Keith. Joni is graduating with her PhD from North Central University in general psychology. She is married to John. And when asked if there's any more education in her future, she said, I think I'm finished. Well done. Then we have Miss Holly Lewis as well, who's graduating. Holly is the daughter of Bobby and Cindy Lewis. She's graduating from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, with a bachelor's in business administration and business management. And then not here, but we want to recognize Miss Bailey Parks as well. Bailey is the daughter of Chevelle and Glenn Parks. She's graduating from UTK Grad School. Uh, with a board certified behavioral analysis degree. So, would you give it up one last time for all of our graduates? Remain standing if you would. We're not quite finished, are we? There was another graduate 
from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky with his Master of Divinity degree, our very own Pastor Brian Thomas. Congratulations. Easy people this time. Um, family members, parents, if you could and would like, come on down as I'm talking and get near your graduate. Get as close as you can if you would like to pray over them. We're going to have to offer one uh, brief prayer here and thank you for being here today. Uh, Brian, we're certainly proud of you with Amber and the boys and all of the work and ministry you do here and completing that great degree. It's uh, quite a feat. And to all of these men and women, we are so incredibly proud of you in the best possible way. We thank God for your hard work, and we look forward to seeing what the Lord is going to do in and through your life in the days to come. So I will join my beautiful bride, and we'll walk this way, and thank the Lord that's going to be um, at least a couple years with no UT payments, right? So praise God. They'll start again before long. But would you guys join me and let's pray together for all of these men and women and all that they've done. Father in heaven, we are so incredibly grateful to celebrate all of these graduates today. Lord, no matter where they're graduating from or at what level, this is a turning of a page. And while some know exactly what they think is written in the next chapter, the truth is all of our days were written in your book before we lived to one. And in reality, we really don't know. We'll make our plans and we'll do what we believe we're called to do. But at the end, God, I'm asking you to guide them. I'm asking you to guard them. I'm asking you to work in and through their lives in such a way that you are raising up a generation that seeks your face, a mighty army, that they would go forth and that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, wherever they go, they would be an influence for the truth. They would be an influence, Lord, for your truth. And that whatever classes you may take them to or whatever workforce they may join, that those who have come through grace would demonstrate that their lives are different because of Jesus. Lord, as a dad today, I'm so proud of my own and I'm grateful for her. But Lord, also I look at each of these and I'm so grateful that you have allowed them to enjoy this milestone in their lives. Take them on, Lord, to even greater things for your glory and for their good. Bless their families. Thank you for the sacrifice they've made. Thank you for the generosity of parents and for spouses and others that have worked so hard to see that these men and women get here this day. God, would you bless them? Would you do what only you could do in and through them? And we'll be sure you get the praise and glory every step of the way for Lord, these graduates are a precious gift. And so we thank you for them now, and we lift them up in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you. Let's remain standing as we continue to worship. You know, as, uh, as the Lord brings these graduates to mind, keep, keep, keep them in prayer, you know, as they go ahead in the future that God has laid out before them and that they would follow his will and his word. But you know, we're all looking forward to a, a wonderful, promising, glorious future, right? When Jesus comes back and everything is eternal and all the temperance left behind. So let's sing this song and let's worship together, singing about our own future that will last forever and that will be glorious. Do you feel the world is broken? shadows deepen we do but do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do. do you wish that you could see it all made new we do. it's all The glory of the Lord to be the light we 
within our midst. Is it good that we remind ourselves of it? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole?
give you praise, Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Lord, what an honor it is and how special it is to be able to come here and openly worship you, Lord Father. Thank you for loving us so much to do so much. Lord, thank you for allowing us to worship you. What a privilege it is to do so. And Lord, we're just praying, God, that we will learn, Father, as we continue on this process for the saved called sanctification, becoming more and more like you, Lord, uh, every day, Lord. May we do so, and only through the word of God can we do that. And Lord, I pray that we will take to heart what is taught this morning by Pastor Bobby. We pray that you will bless him, anoint him as he delivers your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. I love that worship today. Take your Bibles and join me in Genesis 3. Please open them up, click them, swipe them, however you get to a copy of God's Word. And I want to um, just mention a couple of things before we get right back into this mini-series. It was a three-parter. It's turned into a four-parter. Um, I needed to spend some time last week, and I want to say a couple of things um, without going over everything. Number one, thank you for your encouragement for both members of Grace and this community. A number of you reached out to me, and I appreciate it so very much. Some of you tuned in to hear things for the very first time to get our perspective on the events of the Academy. And I thank you for your words. They really meant a lot to me. And so whether you're watching this now or later or listening, uh, just on behalf of our church family, we needed that. Uh, we needed to hear from you, and we thank you for that. I also wanna thank you for your generosity I've uh, been in ministry, I, I, this month I begin year 24, actually, in May I begin year 24, but I've never seen a, a, a church with this level of generosity, nor have I in 23 years plus ever seen a week like this. Uh, a lot of times ch churches will give to designated things, and if you do a special offering, a building project, but just your general fund giving, I don't know if you guys have this, those of you that take notes you probably have this. Those of you that don't take notes, we're praying that you'll repent and get right with the Lord. No, I'm kidding. Uh, on the back side, if the giving at a glance, you guys, the, the, the Grace family together gave nearly half a million dollars to the ministry just this week. Just this week. So I think that, uh, thank you for that. Let's give the Lord some praise for that. Um, nearly half a million dollars in a week. I, I was telling the guys earlier, it's, uh, I think I was in ministry five, maybe six years before our annual budget was that high, the whole year. And so the fact that you're that generous allows us to be that much more generous and to give away where we find need, where we see that uh, there's real need out there. You have our assurances that we will be good stewards with the resources. I'm also told this week by all of our subcontractors that everything is on target, that their dates and schedule for the entire Worship Center revision is looking great. We will be in here next Sunday morning, same time. We will not be in here the following. So in two weeks, we'll start in GSM, different service times. If you wanna try to get up and come really early, you get free Krispy Kreme, coffee. There'll be free coffee all throughout, but that'll be a really cozy adventure over there in GSM with all the people here. So it's gonna be a lot of fun, but thank you for being so incredibly generous on behalf of all of our team. Um, we really do thank you from the bottoms of our heart uh, for all that you've done. I also wanna mention one last thing I got an opportunity to speak to our GCA faculty and staff this week just to try to love on them a little and encourage them after a very difficult end of the previous week. And the thing that I said to them and what I said to my prayer partners this morning and the thing I want you to hear me say is that my goal in the events of these days is not simply to move on. I think that's wrong sometimes to say, let's just get that behind us. What I told them is rather than think move on, let's work hard to move up. And that's different. Let us learn and grow and remember that while some things are meant for evil, God may have meant things for good. And there may be salvation, there may be recommitments, there may be learning which already is taking place to make us even better as an academy, as a church, as a ministry. And so don't just think of moving on, think of moving up. And let me say as we come back into this series, when you fall in sin, Notice I didn't say if, right? We're all old enough to know that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that we stumble in many ways, that none is righteous, no, not one, that the best we can give is filthy rags. So when we fall in sin, learn to move up and not just move on. 
What is God showing me? What is God teaching me? And remember what someone said to me many, many years ago, God doesn't waste pain. What are you learning? How are you growing? How are we growing? And so that's what I'm trying to focus on in this. And again, I cannot thank you enough for your words of love and encouragement as we seek to do better for the Lord, for the gospel, for our community, and to the uttermost. So let's look at this text we've been learning in this series, Genesis Fact or Fiction. We're talking about this slippery slope of sin. And today, more than any other, hopefully you'll see why I'm calling it the slippery slope of sin. We often think about sin in terms of two simple concepts, commission, action, what I do, or omission, what I failed to do that I should have done. And the Bible certainly speaks of sin in that manner. There's acts of commission. There are lacking acts of omission. But the slippery slope of sin includes a a lot more than just doing wrong or not doing right. There are lots of things that sort of lead up to it. Think about it like coming up to a mountain. There are lots of things that lead up to the summit of sin and things that then trail away from the summit of sin. And what I'm trying to get us to see, and the reason I think it's so important to spend so much time in this section, is because, remember, this is the pivot around which the narrative of Scripture turns. Everything is good and good, good and very good. It looks wonderful for our first family. Our parents are doing great, so we thought. They were married in the garden. They have everything they could possibly ever want or need. They have God himself interacting with them, walking with them. And now we have this hinge, this pivot, this turn where the entire narrative of Scripture changes. When you remove chapter 3, you can't even understand the rest of the Bible. But what we find also in chapter 3, and we'll get there several weeks from now, but in Genesis 3.15, we have that proto-evangelium. Remember, that first gospel. So I want you to say it with me again. Next week, we'll start to throw some blanks in the mix. But let's start to say this together to learn where do we see the first glimpse that there's hope beyond our sinful condition. Let's say it. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Good. Now remember, that's the serpent and Christ, the seed of woman. That's pointing to the Messiah. And it's saying that he's going to be dealt a fatal blow to the head. You will be hurt, though, in the process, and we know that our Lord was. So what have we learned? We've learned that the slippery slope of sin often starts with doubt, And it includes distortion and denial. Would you now stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? Let me reread for us one through seven. And we're going to, this week and next, we're going to get to the, the rest of these D words and see how when we lead up to the sin, it's important to understand. And when we trail away from the act, it's also important to understand. And I hope it's going to help some of you that may be somewhere on this slippery slope. Let's read. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, that's of course the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it. She's just added to the word of the Lord, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, flat out denial, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is a powerful text. We could read this thing a thousand times or more, and there would still be truth that we would find emerging before us. I pray that in what we're learning in these these weeks together, it would help us to steer clear from this slippery slope. Every one of us has been on it. Every one of us will in all likelihood be on it again. But it's not just the act of sin 
or it is not just the failure to do right. There's a lot that leads up and there's a lot that trails from. So teach us now by your word and your spirit. Let us be more like you when we leave than when we came. And where we have fallen and failed, where we have sinned and brought shame, may there be forgiveness and full restoration. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you and be seated. So let's jump back in now. We said in four last week, the slippery slope of sin includes dishonesty. And of course I said lies are like rabbits, they multiply quickly, right? Like those baby finches we had, they just keep coming. So we've seen doubt, distortion, denial, dishonesty. Now, number five, we see that the slippery slope of sin includes deception. Deception. Now you may hear that word and think that's the exact same as dishonesty, but it's more than dishonesty. Deception means uh, purposefully misleading or falsely persuading. It's uh, from old Latin. Actually, it means to ensnare or to take captive. So let me see if I can explain it this way. To be dishonest and lie is often to protect oneself. To go the next step into deception means the enemy, in this case Satan himself, not only wants to raise himself up, but he wants to bring humanity down. To purposefully deceive goes beyond self-preservation. Now, it's very interesting to me that in the King James, the old King James rendering of verse 5, it says this, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, see this is Satan talking, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, I believe the rendering of the new King James is a little more accurate to the Hebrew, that you shall be like God or as God. The old King James says as the gods, but either way, however that's rendered, Satan is trying to make Adam and Eve believe that God is not really good, but God is jealous. And the Bible does say God is jealous, but not in this sense. Not in God which wants to withhold something good from you, his child, what Satan's trying to do is indicate that the path to knowledge, the path to real knowledge, is, is just to bypass God's word. Now, he takes his, his lies, his dishonesty a step further into deception, and he says, you know what? Something good will come out through your disobedience. You'll be like God. Your eyes will be opened. You'll diminish or you'll distinguish good and evil. So how could wanting to be like God be wrong? You see, Satan sometime before had already tried to raise himself up into God's place. He had utterly failed and totally fallen. Now he wants to bring Adam and Eve with him. And he relies on the senses. You know, the fruit is lovely. It's fresh looking Living Bible renders it that way in verse six. How could anything that looked and smelled so pleasant be bad? The New Testament actually confirms here that Eve was deceived in this moment. Look at 2 Corinthians eleven three 3 on your screens. It says, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. You see what Paul is saying? She was deceived, and in his deception, the serpent drew her away from the truth. He does not want us to find the same fate. Look at Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We had a peach tree right outside of our bedroom window. The first few years we were in our house, man, it produced so many peaches. The problem was the tree had developed a lean years earlier, way beyond what could now be straightened, and it had not been pruned properly, and so it would just literally drag the ground. Very hard to mow around, and of course it was fun to watch the animals come up and eat all of those uh, peaches and everything, but I had to get out there and, and try to do some pruning, try to save it. Unfortunately, my pruning went a little far, I ended up with a chainsaw in my hand, as often happens, and I hacked it into this little sad stick thing. It then never came back, it did not survive, and then I later discovered when I, when I actually cut it down earlier this year that it was sort of rotten in the middle anyway, so it was time to go. But I went down here to the nursery, and I bought us an apple tree in its place. My wife loves honey crisp apples. Those are her favorite. We buy several types, but those are her favorite. So she said, if you can find a honey crisp, buy that. So I did, and I planted it, and now we're watering it a little bit every day. Now, that's, it's looking beautiful already. I don't expect much this year, but in a few years. But I absolutely do not expect 
to get peaches off that Honeycrisp apple tree. I don't expect to get galas or Fujis or anything else. I expect, if the tag was right, to get Honeycrisp apples. That is true in the plant world. That is true in your world and my world. When you put something in the ground, if it is good, expect good to come. If it is rotten or bad, expect the bad to come. That's what's happening here. Satan is lying and then he's deceiving. He's trying to bring them down to elevate himself and he's questioning God's goodness and doubting God's love. And when we do that, we're playing into Satan's hands He makes it sound so good. You're going to be like God. He tried it and he failed. Now, have we ever been deceived into thinking sin will actually be good for us? Well, sure we have. If you've ever cheated to get a better grade, if you thought, if I just do this, I'll get that. If you've ever fudged a resume to get a better job, If you've ever faked it to get a relationship, I don't know anything about digital dating. Praise God. We didn't have anything smart other than my wife when we met. And so there was no technology, but I understand that people post pictures and then they swipe this way or that way and whatever all of that means. But, you know, I've heard tales of people putting on either somebody else's picture or their picture from 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Bubba, you change. And so what are you expecting? Are you hoping when you show up and you fudge that image on that dating thing that you're going to show up and they're going to say, well, I'm hard of seeing. I guess you, I I can't see well, hard of seeing. (laughs) I can't see well. Uh, I I guess that's you. Is that what you're hoping for? Are they going to see you and go, what have I gotten myself into? It's going to come back to bite you. You know, when you fudge, you know, when you deceive that it's going to come to light to try to get a better grade, a better job, a better relationship. Because listen, Satan always promises pleasure and he always pays with pain. And if you've ever taken the shortcut, if you've ever tried to get around the way that God wanted you to go, you find nothing but pain at the end of the track. There's doubt, distortion, denial, dishonesty, deception. Now look look at this one, number six. The slippery slope of sin includes desire. Desire, verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. And she gave to Adam who was with her. When the woman saw, do you see this evaluation process she goes through? There's an appeal to the appetite. We call that lust of the flesh. She saw it was good for food. It was pleasant to the eye. Pleasant to the eye. Same root word used in Exodus 20 in the Ten Commandments related to coveting. She looked at it. And she saw that she had now this new lust in her eye. And then it desirable to make one wise. Again, that root concept is related to the idea of pride and the idea of coveting. And so we find the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The Bible talks about that in 1 John 2. John wrote, for all that is in the world, The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That is not of the Father, but it is of the world. So this idea of coveting, you know, I'm looking at this practically, and it does look good for food, and I'm looking at it for the pleasure it brings to my eyes, and it's aesthetically pleasing, and I'm looking at it for the potential to gain wisdom. I'll be in the know, but I'm getting closer and closer to that thing God said, do not eat. But the closer I get, the better it looks. Is the desire sinful? Well, at this point, I'm going to say no, and I'm going to try to explain that. I do not think to this point Eve has sinned by having the desire. Now, she sinned when she distorted the word of God. She sinned when she added to, God said you can't eat, nor can we even touch. That was a sin. But has she really sinned in desiring it? I'm not so sure. Desire certainly can be sinful as it turns into lust. But we don't know how much Adam shared with her. We don't know how much of God's command he's told her. We're never told that. But I want you to understand something. Desire is not always sinful. What do you mean? All right, well, let's watch. James 1. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. 
For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So God's not behind this. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Now what? That's the slippery slope. I'm being drawn like a moth to the flame. I desire the light. I desire the light. Zap. And so when we're drawn and enticed away, but is it sin yet? Well, according to James, watch, then when desire has conceived, it brings forth sin. Do you see the difference? The sin's not there quite yet, but the desire conceives and brings forth sin. And then, of course, sin, as it grows, brings forth death. The history of every temptation, really every sin, I believe, is related and somewhat similar. Think about it like this. There's this outward object of attraction. There's this inward turmoil of the mind. There's increase and ultimately overtaking of passionate desire, ending in degradation and slavery and ruin. That's why we always have told our children, make your decisions before you get in the moment, whatever that is. And then we put parameters in place to try to protect them, mind, body, spirit. But you can't decide in the moment. And it's not just teenagers, it's all of us. You don't make decisions in the moment, particularly if there's desire, passion, any of the like involved. Jesus was determined before he got hungry after 40 days in the wilderness, before his 40-day fast, Jesus decided, I will not bow to Satan. That's why when Satan said, hey, Jesus, why don't you just make these stones become bread? He's enticing him. But Jesus wouldn't fold and Jesus wouldn't fail. And you've got to make some determinations ahead of time. I will not fold. John Piper says that sin, lust for example, quote, gets its power by persuading me to believe that I will be more happy if I follow it. The power of all temptation is the prospect that it will make me happier. She gives me back too much change. This is a giant company I've spent a lot of money here. I don't need to give that back. I need that. After all, have you tried to fill up your gas tank lately? There's a mistake somewhere on the taxes. Too much money has been given. The grade was wrong. They gave me a higher mark than I deserved, etc. You fill in the blank in your life. But the point is, we go down this road because we think it's going to be better for us. Now, I'm not saying here that desire itself is necessarily a bad thing. But desire left unchecked and unencased, I'll show you, is a disaster waiting to happen. Look at Proverbs 5. I'll make you blush for a second. Let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice with the wife of your youth as a loving deer and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? Now, we could go on and I could give you much uh, more even from places like Song of Solomon and talking about the pleasure the young man thought he would get, but he was as though an ox was being led to slaughter when the seductress took him away. But notice the proverbial language here is that there is this passion, there's this desire for the wife of your youth. I like to show it when I'm doing counseling, I show it in this way. Now what I've got here, we're gonna pretend, is a bag of gunpowder. You would never store it this way, so it's not gunpowder, it's pepper, and it's very strong. Um, so that's not, that's not gunpowder. Everybody clear with me? Everybody watching? It's not gunpowder. It's pepper. But can we pretend for a moment? Anybody reload? If you reload, you know if I had this much gunpowder and there was even a hint of a spark in here, we would have a major problem. Because it wouldn't just hurt me. It would explode and go out in every direction. Gunpowder like this a big, big problem. But gunpowder like this, this is a a 12 gauge shell. I didn't do any good this year, turkey season. I went a few times and loved every minute of it, but didn't do any good. But this is last year in East Tennessee. There's some spurs, there's a beard from the bird, but I always do my shells. If it's something I wanna keep and mark, so this was 4421 East Tennessee. This is the three and a half inch Magnum 12 gauge shell I used on this particular bird. You can see it's spent, nothing's in it because the primer cap is popped. But the primer cap creates a spark, then there's some powder in here, 
a little bit of powder, not like this. A little bit of powder, there's a wadding, and then there are the pellets that are used in a shotgun shell, similar in a bullet, but with a solid projectile. And so what happens here is that when the powder is properly measured out, it is properly encased, it becomes an, a very effective tool. This bird, all I can tell you about him now that I remember is that he was delicious and he fed the Lewis family. And so this was an, a, ver, a very effective tool that I used in its proper encasement, okay? You're following that. The proper encasement for the type of passion that Proverbs is mentioning would be marriage. In my marriage, properly encased, pointed only to that beautiful lady, only one person, that proper encasement, it's a very powerful, wonderful gift from God. The desire, the passion, the heart there is not wrong. It is not dirty. It is not anything to be ashamed of, but it has to be properly encased. If it is not and desire is left unchecked, you will create problems for you and everybody around you. And the reason you never make the decision in the moment is it's too hot. There are too many sparks and it's deadly. It is dangerous. And so whether it is about relationships or whether it is about jobs, grades, whatever it may be, we've got to remember that Satan is trying to draw us away. He is trying to tempt us. He's trying to keep us from encasing our life properly. And the word of God is what informs us and tells us, yes, no, this way, okay, that way, deadly, that way, dangerous. And so I want you to see that. I try to share this with couples a lot. I try to say that if you put your desire, your energy in the right direction, fine. That's an okay thing, that's a beautiful gift, but the moment it becomes unencased, it is deadly, it is a problem. We have seen doubt, distortion, denial, dishonesty, deception, desire. Let me close with the simplest of them all and the one that you often think of when you think of this text. The slippery slope of sin includes disobedience. This is where most people say the problem is centered. And while this may sort of be, if you will, the tip of the iceberg, this is not the root of the problem. It is the result of the problem. The slippery slope of sin includes disobedience. Verse six, so when the woman saw, it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, desirable to make one wise, she took, notice, She had its fruit, she ate its fruit, and as sin often does, it multiplies. She gave to her husband with her, we'll come back to that, and he ate. Now what do I want you to get out of this? A lot of stuff, but I'm gonna boil it down to a simple statement. Satan will tempt, but he cannot force. He did not literally move Eve's hand to take of that apple or peach or pear, whatever was on that fruit tree. We don't know, we just know it was a tree. But let's just say that apple. He didn't make her do it. He may persuade you to act, but now this is for Christians. By the way, if you're not a Christian, I'm not talking to you. If you're not a Christian, you don't have the Holy Spirit living within you, therefore you don't have the person, nor do you have the power to overcome Satan. You just don't, you're like a puppet. You might as well be on strings because you're on his side. You say, no, 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 I'm not on his side. I just haven't decided yet. I haven't trusted Christ. No, you're in the family or you're not. No gray area. You're in, you're out. You're with the Lord or you're not. And so here, Satan for the Christian can persuade, but you can never say, and I can never say, the devil made me do it. Now, I know some of us have tried that before, but it is an utter failure. Because Eve tried it. Adam blamed Eve. We'll see this later. Eve blamed the serpent. And God said, oh, you're still going to be punished. God said, I'm not buying it. Yes, he punished the serpent too. Yes, he punished Adam. But he also punished Eve here. And so what we find, and I'm not really going to spend a lot of time here. I'm really not because this is where the church spends too much of her time. We have often boiled Christianity down to a bunch of rules and regulations, much like the Pharisees did in the days of Christ. And I really 
don't want to focus as much on the eating as I do what led up to it and what would follow from it. We've said about Christianity, just do this and don't do that and you'll be okay. God will love you, you'll be a good Christian. Just read your Bible, just pray, just go to church and give and serve and, and maybe sing in the choir or teach Sunday school or keep nursery. Just do that, be a good guy, be a good guy. And just, you know, don't drink or smoke or chew or go with girls that do. Just, you know, avoid certain things, right? Right? Avoid certain, I'm glad Cindy stopped chewing. That stuff is nasty. And you know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, nothing like it has ever touched my sweetheart's lips. The reality is this. The reality is this, folks. We have boiled Christianity into moral therapeutic deism. We have tried to say, I'll do this and not do that. I'll live a moral life, but I really don't want God totally involved in my day-to-day -day affairs. And that's not Christianity. I'll close with it like this. True hunters and fishermen know that it's not just killing or catching. I just told you I didn't kill anything this year for turkey season. Now, admittedly, I didn't go very often, but a couple times I got to enjoy time with my son and some other guys. I've gotten to enjoy the outdoors. The season ends today. I don't have time to go today. So I didn't get anything, and that's perfectly okay. I still had the joy of getting ready and prepping and going out. That happens with fishing. There are days when I will catch. There are days when I will not. But that's not what a fisherman is all about, nor is it what a hunter is all about, nor should it be what a Christian is all about. It's not just the grand victories and the great things. It's about living life day to day, walking with the Lord. And you know, the negative side of sin is not just the act of sin itself that we should be focused on, but what led up to it. What has led us there? That's why I keep saying we're not just gonna move on, we're gonna move up. What has led to this moment? Like a glacier on top of the sea, we only see a small portion of the larger issues below. Some of you in your marriages today, you are looking at the tip of the iceberg, but you are failing to address what is below the surface. And until you address what is below the surface, you are merely making some ice chips. You need to get down. Utilize our Grace Biblical Counseling Ministry. Call on our pastors. Do it God's way and let's stop reducing Christianity to mere behavior modification. Now listen to me folks. As we close this out, I am telling you Jesus Christ did not come to this world live as we live, tempted as we are, and yet he never failed and never sinned. He did not bear the nails of Calvary or the thorns or the stripes. He did not pray and have as though there were sweat drops of blood coming from his brow. He did not go through the agony, the pain, the shame, so that you would simply act better. He went through it to give you a heart transplant, to totally change you from the inside out. Not that you could say, yes, sir, no, no, sir, do this, don't do that, but so that you could walk with God in a relationship every single day to say, I know that I am his and he is mine. He is my father. And so I choose to do the right things because I know it'll put a smile on my dad's face. I know this is what he wants me to do. And so I walk in obedience because I get to, not because I have to. And that's the gospel. That's the gospel. You, I, I want you to get it. I want you to get it. Because when you get it, when you get what God has for you and he gets a hold of you, then you're not so much worried about whether anybody's around or not. You are going to walk a path of sanctification, growing in Christ likeness, because you get to. Because it's a joy. Because Christianity is not just yes, no, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Yes, they ate. Yes, they disobeyed. Yes, you might argue this is the summit of the issue, but there was a lot that led them up to the slippery slope of sin. Stand with me this morning. Listen. Every time, our kids, you know, are going on camp in a few weeks. I used to love doing camp. I did about five years of camp. Now, not a student pastor, but I'd go play and do some Bible study. Every year, invariably, there would be kids that would come to me between sessions, and they'd say something like this. Pastor Bobby, they say, I need to know if doing this, fill in the blank, is okay. Could I do this with my girlfriend? 
You know, like I, they wanted me to explain bases to them. I still hadn't figured those out. I don't know. They wanted me to explain. And nine times out of 10, I would say, now, young man, young woman, by the fact that you are asking, you already know the answer. By the fact that you're asking, what I would encourage you to do when it comes to this in your life is let's not see how close we can get before we start to slide. How about we stay as far back from that black diamond of sin as possible? How about we stay way away from that edge so that we don't have to concern ourselves? Am I going down this path? Now, some of you are already on it. You feel like you're out of control. Number one, you need Christ. If you're not a Christian, you will not stop on your own you will end up at the bottom. Number two, if you're a Christian, you already have the person and the power within you to stop. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You just need to be reminded, refreshed, get back into the word, and we would love to help you with that. Today, I'm gonna ask you to pray. I'm gonna ask you to pray for yourself. I'm gonna ask you to pray for our graduates. I'm gonna ask you to pray for this horrible tragedy that took place in Buffalo, continuing to pray for what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. And I'm just going to ask you to pray that we at Grace would be focused on not just moving on, but moving up. That we are going to learn, that we are going to grow, that we are going to be a lighthouse for a hurting world in darkness. And as we transition out for a couple of months, and it looks a little different, feels a little different, and as we come back in, I would remind you that new carpet and seats and staging and all of that stuff, new paint, all of that stuff is fine and wonderful and we're grateful for, but all of that stuff is not the church. You are and I am. And when we go from this place, what really matters about grace is how we live out there, not just how we raise our hands in here. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for this truth of your word. We know that there was disobedience there. It's easy to talk about the disobedience But what about the deception that led to it? What about the desire that conceived? What about the things that were moving Eve and Adam with her toward this tragic decision that has impacted all of humanity, even this very earth that groans for redemption and restoration? I don't know where everybody is today, but I know enough to know this. We're all sinful people. And if we're Christians, we're saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ alone. And I know, but by your grace, Lord, we could all fall very far, very fast. And so you hold us by your righteous right hand. You uphold us by your word and your spirit. Somebody here today needs to be upheld. Somebody here today needs to come home. Somebody needs to come back home. Somebody needs to lay something before you. Somebody needs to pray for a friend or family. Lord, I particularly pray today for my friends, the Callaways. I know this was a hard day for them and leading up to this time. But Lord, we know that Mark is with you. We know he's in your presence. And that's certainly the best place any of us could be. But my heart still hurts for a dad and a mom. And so I pray for my sweet friends today. And I pray, Lord, in these last few minutes we have together, we'd be serious about doing our business with you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're so inclined, the altar's open. Thank you so much for watching us today. God is doing absolutely amazing things in and through our Grace Baptist Church family. If you'd like to share anything the Lord is doing in your life, feel free to reach out to us through our website or our app. And if you're ever in the Knoxville area, come by and worship with us and our family of faith here at Grace Baptist Church.